Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 82. My guest today is Rosie Lalonde, who is a flower photographer. So Rosie's going to talk about various lighting techniques, camera settings, post-processing, and things like that to create amazing flowers so stay tuned but first I just got to do my little thing remember you can watch us live on Facebook which hopefully you are right now we uh, go live at 4 p.m. Eastern time we're on Eastern Daylight Time right now and it's on the Understand Photography Facebook page so if you're on our page and you can't find us or whatever just scroll down and, and you'll see the live feed but then uh, then we put the video on YouTube please subscribe and we make it into a podcast on iTunes so you can listen to us in the car. Many, many ways to listen or watch the Understand Photography show. I've got, still have one opening left for my ladies' photo retreat, which is May 4th through the 6th here in Naples, Florida. It's a very small group, only three ladies and me, and you'll learn all kinds of stuff. It's just a big, diverse weekend. We go through night photography, uh, slow shutter speeds, um, in long exposures, we do the old Naples photo tour. We go on a boat and photograph the Cape Romano Dome Home. All kinds of cool stuff. Packed in one weekend, May 4th through the 6th. Go on our site, Understand Photography, and you can find it. Or you can always email me, too, at peggy at understandphotography.com. And if you want to get more comfortable with, if you feel like you really don't have the good foundation in photography or you're a beginner, our four weeks to proficiency in photography online class starts May 2nd and it starts my, May 2nd because it is a live class all right I'm teaching the class you're gonna be with me so that you can ask questions right away if you can't find a setting a dial or a button on your camera you can say hey Peggy I can't find this how do I do this or I don't understand and I'm right there to help you you've got homework to help the you know everything that you're learning really really sink in it's a great class starts May 2nd so that is that's on our website or you can go directly to our site online photo workshops and you can check out our other classes there as well so welcome Rosie thank you for having me Peggy so Rosie Lalonde teaches mm -hmm. workshops for flower photography as well as Photoshop techniques yes. right um, she really captures the heart and soul of a flower so today you're gonna teach us how to be just as good as you right I'm gonna try <laughs> Now give me the very short version of how you got into photography because you've been a photographer for a long time. Yes, since my early 20s, um, in the days when they had this thing called film. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I went from having a photo studio in my house for children and family to commercial photography to wedding photography and spent a lot of years in wedding photography with my husband and my two daughters. Oh, wow. I retired. The whole family. The whole family. I retired to Florida in 2011, okay. and I tried to bring the wedding photography roadshow to Florida, and it wasn't going to happen. It, it's, you know, it had become my ceiling, and I needed to go somewhere else, okay. but I wasn't sure where. Um, Mike and I started to go to the Orlando Camera Club every now and then, and one night, as it happens, Denise Ippolito was there, mm. and she did a presentation on floral photography. That was it. That was it for me. I, you know, the bug bit me. I am still smitten, and I, I don't think I will ever stop being smitten with my love for flowers and flower photography. Wow, that's a good story. You know, it's funny because I, I we talked on the phone. I have a similar story where you know weddings and portraits, and then all of a sudden you start getting yep. more into the nature and different things, and it's, it's a. Uh, it's just a more creative outlet. And I don't know if it's a more creative outlet. It's just that after you've done the same thing for 18, yes. 20 years, yes. it's not that it's not fun anymore, but it's not as exciting as when you get into something new, I think. It isn't. And there's something about photography having to come from your heart and soul. And I find that I can always tell the difference between somebody who's going through the motions and somebody that really has that inner eye. Oh, I like that. You can teach people how to use a camera, but you can't always teach people how to have an eye. They may have an eye and it's underdeveloped, which is fine, and you can kind of coax that out and bring that out and show them how to get inspiration for that to grow. Um, but occasionally I've come across a person or two that just doesn't have an eye and they go, they 
they're technically perfect, but there's no life in the image. I see what you're saying. I, I wonder about that, though, because I know there's a wedding photographer in town who's a very left brain person. I've mm -hmm. known her for a very long time. And uh, at first, I used to think that of her pictures, but as she got more experienced, she got more and more creative. But I don't, but I don't think, I think it was learned creativity t with her. Right. And her stuff is fabulous. So who knows? You know, there's nothing wrong with following a photographer. Now, particularly in floral photography, there aren't that many great floral photographers out there, but there are three, four, five that I still go to, and I love to see when they do something new, because you have to have inspiration. Yeah. If you don't have inspiration, it's hard to grow. So you can go take those same flower pictures over and over and over, hoping to find something new, or you can come with new inspiration. Sometimes I find that a little bit of a drought in between floral photography expeditions is really good because you're hungry for it. Uh -huh. And you just, you know, those creative juices start to kick in and you just find something new. Or, you know, you recall, oh, I saw so-and-so and yes, they did this and they photographed this way. And, you know, it really does make a difference. Yeah, that's true. I think shooting with other photographers is always a good idea. It definitely you is. You know, feed off of each other. Exactly. <laughs> The, um, the saying that iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. When you're with people who are talented and you can kind of look in the back of their camera and they can look at yours, surprising, you know, how much you can help each other and, and really grow and, and have an enjoyable time. Yeah, I'm always jealous. I'm like, <laughs> how come you think of all these cool things? <laughs> all right, so step us through. So what's involved in creating a stunning, stunning floral image? Okay. The very first thing is you have to have a stunning floral. Yeah, because a lot of them are all beat up and they bugs are. eat them. And they are. And do you so ever take those and just Photoshop the bug holes or whatever? I do. Okay. But you can only do that so much. Okay. And so, particularly if it's a um, less sturdy flower, so um, more of a see-through, delicate type of flower, it gets harder and harder to fix really bad. And they wilt too, don't they? They do wilt. And so you want an image that is definitely as stellar, as pristine as it can possibly be. The next thing that you need to do is to bring your passionate heart. Okay. Because if you're out there just because you have to be, it's not going to help you get a stunning image. You have to want to be there. Okay. The setting up of the camera and the lens choices and all of that. I know you'll lead us through that, but just the pure basics of getting that stunning flower is pristine flower, bringing your passion, and then sitting and getting to know that flower. Now, do you have like little motivational sayings that you say to yourself? <laughs> I remember one guy, he was, uh, I, I, uh, he was assisting somebody, somebody, I can't remember who it was, but it was some photographer, wedding photographer in, in Miami, and it was somebody big. Anyway, he said on the way there, they were driving to the wedding, and the guy was going like this, this is going to be the best wedding I've ever photographed. I'm going to blow these people's minds. And he just, he was like talking to himself the whole Motivation drive there. speaking to yourself. <laughs> I thought that's kind of a good idea. You know what I mean? We need, we all need to be pumped up. You know. Before I do flower photography, I usually go back and I look at my previous, you know, captures. I have literally hundreds of images I haven't even taken to post-processing. I'm waiting for that right time, that right moment. But a lot of times seeing what I had before and maybe how I've processed it allows me to go into that photo shoot, maybe seeing the end of the image from the beginning. Okay. So before I ever start to photograph it, I'm seeing like, yeah, look at the potential here and look at this. But I also find that when I did portrait photography, I always sat and just talked with my subject. talent, subject, whatever. Yeah. And I would watch their face and I would say, oh, you know, look at that side of their face. It looks, yeah, that's the side I want to photograph from her. Look at that beautiful smile when you say just the right thing. 
approaching a flower is very much the same. Except you, you can't. Do you talk to the flowers? I absolutely ah! do. <laughs> You know, and not that they answer me back, <laughs> but if you watch it in the wind, how it blows, and if you move yourself from side to side, or you get underneath it, or you stand on top, you know, sometimes I just get on my knees in the dirt or whatever to get close because I just want to see its character and its makeup. And so much of the time, if I look at it through the lens of my camera instead of with my own two eyes, I see something different. Okay. A lot of people also find that if they put the live view on in their camera, they're able to see a composition or see something that's like, ooh, you just don't see that when you're looking at it. You know, our eyes are marvelous and they see all kinds of things. But to just hone in on something very small on a flower or just a particular part of it, you've got to see in that macro vision. Okay. So that's a very important thing to bring to a photo shoot. Okay. All right. So what? So what's next? What's next is the things that are not so creative, and that is knowing your camera. Okay. Knowing how to set your camera up. So let me just go through a few things with you that I step through. Okay. As as I go out and I I want to shoot. I love this. Okay. Um, I know to begin with that in order to get the right image, I'm gonna have to fill my frame with that flower. <clears throat> okay. So I wanna set my camera up so that I'm able to do that pretty much effortlessly. Um, <clears throat> I set my camera up so that I'm shooting in raw mode okay. and aperture priority. Okay. Now from time to time, I will shoot in manual if I need to, but you can't do it in auto mode. You can't let the camera think for you. Okay. You have to be in charge of your f-stop and your subsequent depth of field. I begin to look through the lens of my camera. So I've, at this point, I've decided on a lens. More often than not, I go with my telephoto lens first. Okay. And a lot of people are like, well, you're a macro photographer. Why are you doing that? The compression in a telephoto lens is so phenomenal that I make sure that I have a lens that has a, um, a pretty close um, distance where I can focus. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe within 14 or 18 inches. Now I'm using a 70 to 300 millimeter lens. I can get really close to that flower and I can get a compression that's gonna blur my background, and I can start to get that flower with a lot of focus in it, but a blurry background. The next thing I do is I look at my ISO. So if I'm outside, mm -hmm. depending on how much light there is between 200 and 400 ISO, if I'm inside, 800 or 1,000 ISO. Are you on a tripod? I don't use a tripod unless I have to really? inside. And that's the only time I'll use a tripod is inside. Okay. So I'm hand holding. That's interesting. If I find that my 70 to 300 can't get me quite close enough, I will use an extension tube. I'll use like a 10 millimeter extension tube. Okay. And that goes in between your camera body and your lens. And now that 300 is even more than 300 but okay. I can get closer. Okay. So m my feeling very often is I like to see the flower in focus with a nice blurry background. That's how I tend to work best. Okay, but you want the whole <clears throat> flower in focus, right? Or At that point, the whole flower would be pretty much in focus. Okay. Because with a telephoto lens, my 70 to 300, my widest aperture is 4.5. So you're going to get a good amount of focus. Okay. All right. But I always take out my other camera with my macro lens, and I go and do that, uh, that type of shoot with the flower as well. Now, what's the length of your macro lens? I have a 105. Okay. And it's a 2.8 lens. So if I'm shooting that flower really close up and I'm going one to one or two to one or three to one, you're getting very little of that flower in focus. And yeah. that can be an amazing thing as well. Mm -hmm. I try to determine at the end of the day which image I like the best. 
which is speaking to me most? That one that's up close and personal with the macro with lots of blur in it? Or is it that macro that says, look at me, the flower is saying, look at me. And then there's, you know, I've, I've shot it with my telephoto. So the amount of busyness in the background is gone. And, you know, I've got this really nice flower image in front of this very nice blurry background. Now, do you shoot with two cameras or do you switch lenses? I shoot with three cameras. Ah, not two, but three. Three, because my <laughs> third camera, I have a lens baby on. Oh, I have so a lens baby, they're fun. They are fun. And I, it's taken me a while to obtain three different cameras, but I have a lot of lenses. And the thing that I hate the most is changing lenses when too. I'm in the middle of, you know, trying to be creative and, I told you I'm on my way to a wedding right after this. Yeah. I've got four cameras packed. You have to have for a wedding, don't you? I don't want to be changing lenses. No, no way, not at I, all. But I got to have the fisheye and I got to, you know. Anyway. I do know. <laughs> so we've set our ISO on the camera. We've put a lens on it that, you know, if you have one camera and a few lenses, choose one. You know, maybe give yourself, um, you know, a little... Um, for the day just a little project that says I'm only going to use this lens today and I'm going to see what I can do with it. If you're really frustrated obviously please go change the lens yeah but you know sometimes that's a really neat thing to do because it shows you what you can do okay if you'll just try you know think I outside love, the box. I love having like a forced project yes. like that like I'm only going to use this lens or yes. only going to it's going to I'm going to shoot everything in you know I don't know 2.8 or everything in f8 and see right you know, right. I love doing stuff like that. The one thing I would say is you do have to watch your f-stop because if you're getting to the point where you're starting to see busyness in the background, that doesn't tend to make a really um, beautiful floral portrait. You need a plain background. You, you need one without a lot of busyness in it. I've also found sometimes that as you shoot, you know, light and dark kind of wanes in the background sometimes. Okay. Especially on a sunny day and clouds are coming by. Okay. So you might have part of your background in shade and part of it in the sun, and that's really difficult. So you maybe either want to come back a little later or change your position so that you're not seeing that because it's, it's very important to try to have a background that is, you know, as free of uh, distractions. Okay. You don't want somebody to look at your image and yes, the flower's night, but boy, am I distracted by that background. Yeah. And yes, you can fix some of that in Photoshop and we'll talk about that. Because sometimes if you love the flower, you, you just have to take the shot, a way. irregardless. Do you ever um, put anything like a bring, I see some flower photographers will bring a black piece of cardboard. Yes. Do you do that too? I or? don't usually bring black, but I've created my own backgrounds. And so I print them and put them on an eight and a half by 11 board. And sometimes if I'm by myself, I have to use a plamp. And I got a plamp and I haven't used it yet. I'm like, this is so cool. I need a plamp in case. And what's a plamp in case our audience a doesn't know? A plamp is um, a clamp that's on a kind of a squiggly arm that you can kind of move in all directions. And it, it, it will, uh, you can put it on your tripod or on the, the legs of one of your tripod. You can put it on a light stand. And so it's there to hold either your backdrop or your little card, mm -hmm. whatever you have, or some people like to put a diffuser on their plant so that it's shading the flower because direct sunlight and flowers don't get along. It's like skin in direct sunlight. We don't like it. it, it, it it's <laughs> not flattering at all. Um, uh. You can also use that plant to hold a flower. Now, I wouldn't suggest in going into the botanical garden and picking one of their flowers <laughs> to put on your plant. But let's say it's your garden at home. And uh, you, you just know that if you move um, the flower somewhere outside the garden, hey, you know what, now I can get a nice image of that flower with all the colors of the garden behind it. Yeah. So the plant is a good use for that. Okay, and they're not 
too expensive? Forty-five dollars. Okay. All right. We'll put a link in our sh in our show notes on how to that's how to awesome. Find those. Very good idea. So okay, keep going. So what else? So okay, so these backgrounds you taking pictures of like let's say a blurry green background or something and then put it behind the flower? Is that what you Every mean by that? Every time I go out to shoot, I make sure that I put my lens in manual mode and I defocus and I get a shot of what it would look like if I could get it defocused. And sometimes I'll combine that image and my flower image in Photoshop. Other times, I take... And are you talking about just the flower or like the whole field of flowers or something you want... <laughs> out the, of focus. The whole background of what's behind the flower because sometimes there are other flowers there and it introduces color and or um, in Florida especially you know we have a lot of different fern and palm fronds that sometimes get in the background and that makes beautiful backgrounds. Oh because it's cool patterns right? It is. So now you just you just take a picture of them out of focus. Out of focus. Ah. And then I can use that, combine it in Photoshop with my flower that has the kind of busy background. Okay. And now... So you'd cut the flower out and then stick it on that background, but sometimes you bring those backgrounds with by, on an 8 by 10 I board. Do. Now, That's most cool. of the time, what I do when I bring a background with me mm -hmm. is a background that I've perhaps taken into painter and I've done some swirls with it or I've painted it in some way and then maybe put a linen texture to it, oh. print it out on canvas, apply it to the eight and a half by 11 board. Mm -hmm. And now I can have something that's maybe a little more stylized behind my image. Oh, that's cool. So we, bring, we, we put um, a different image on the front and the back of the board Oh, that's then you have two. Have two, two different colors, two different types, um, and we bring maybe three boards with us. So now we've got six to choose from. Oh, that is such a great idea. I love. I've never heard. I actually do know somebody who did that with um, bugs, a bug photographer who Good put idea. different backgrounds yes. behind the bugs. Sure, because you <laughs> don't. took a picture of the background, put it the picture behind the bug. I've I never been, heard of anybody doing it with flowers, so and I really like that. I've been in so many places where you'll see just this random flower, and you're thinking, oh, I want to shoot that. But the background is like, oh, my. You know, there's maybe a dumpster behind it. Or oh, yeah. You, know, you never know. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, you have to get creative when you really have this love of florals, and you're going to, you know, be oh, somewhere. That's, and That's such a cool idea. I love that. But sometimes you'll cut the flower out. But I would imagine it looks better if you can take it. Because cutting out, sometimes we can tell, you know? You know, I've never cut a flower out when I've added a texture or a background. What you want to do is you want to get your background, if you will, uh -huh. into Photoshop and put it on top of your flower. Okay. Reduce the opacity of that layer. Uh -huh. And then you're going to put a mask on that layer. And you're only going to color in where you want that texture to be. Bring it back up to 100%. And now you can see your flower and mm -hmm. you can see what you're coloring in. And it really is a whole lot easier than cutting out. Oh, very good. Good, good way to do it. All right, so do you use, when you're taking the pictures, do you use filters at all? Not on my camera. All my filter work is done in Photoshop. Okay. I know, because we don't really need to. Not even a polarizing filter? No, especially not with a flower. Okay, why? Polarizers tend to add contrast into an image. That's how, when let's say that you're out on the west coast and you have this beautiful Pacific and it's blue and it's so gorgeous and, but oh my gosh, the sun is shining and it's, you take a picture of it and it's kind of like, oh, no. Yeah, it's too much glare That's and it. it washes it out. You put the polarizer on and now, voila, you've got this nice contrasty bright blue thing. That's the last thing that you want to do to a flower image. You don't want the contrast. That's why you want to shoot it in the shade or with diffused light of some type. Okay. So that you have these nice soft colors mm. and Basically, what you want is nothing in front of that glass. Okay. Okay. Well, You're going to be very careful not to damage that glass. 
um, a, a lot of uh, macro lenses and longer lenses, you know, kind of have a sunshade on it, mm -hmm. so that even if you bang it, it's not going to touch. So the you glass. recommend leaving the shade on all the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Absolutely. Me too. Um, so to me, it's always been more about protection than it is from shading my glass from the sun. Me too. I'm always banging my lenses into Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. And of course, there's a big controversy about using the UV lens. There is, and you know. Unless it's an absolutely clear filter, you're adding some sort of color diminishment or you're adding color that you don't want into the image. Now that's more color correction that you have to do. Yeah. So I found a long time ago, if I just take care of my glass, then I don't need to put any kind of filter on and I can do all the happy filtering in Photoshop. Happy filtering. <laughs> now, do you use, okay, so you told us about lighting, so you said shade is best. Yes. Or at least a scrim of some sort, so you don't have direct light on you the can direct get, sun, I guess. You can get everything from a six inch diffuser up to, you know, a six foot diffuser. Okay. I like to travel with something that's about a foot in diameter. And when you say diffuser, what are you using for a diffuser? Diffuser is generally white on one side and black on the other. Okay. So if I want to push light into the image, it's already shaded, I can use my white side and capture light from someplace else and throw some light on that image. Okay, so you're using that as a reflector? Yes. A white reflector? That reflector side. Okay. When you want to diffuse, you're going to use the black side. Okay. So and you use that as a shade. Absolute shade. Okay. Absolute shade. And again, if you can't hold it in your camera, there's your plamp. Plamp. Such a cool thing. <laughs> and so useful in a variety of ways. Now, do you ever use flash? I don't. No. Because flash is the same thing, unless you're using it very creatively. It's the same thing as adding direct light to, to the flower. Mm -hmm. So again, when I shot weddings, I would never point a flash in a bride's face. A bear, I either, a bear flash. A bear flash. I would use fong or I would, my And thing, when you say fong, <laughs> you can't speak in lingo on this okay. show. <laughs> the Gary Fong light sphere is Thank what you. you're talking about. That's which what is, I'm by talking the way, about. my favorite diffuser. I love that thing. Anyway, so you would always use a diffuser of some sort. Yes. You would never point a flash directly at a person, and you never point a bare flash directly at a flower. No. But you don't point any kind of flash no. at a flower. No. The only time I've shot flowers with flash is when I've had to do like a bridal bouquet. Oh, so and that's night not, or something? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not one single image. But even with that, I would point my flash behind me and the little white card that's on the end of the flash would pick up just enough light to just light Push those little dark places that you need to. If someone wanted to do that, and I would say if I were shooting inside, I might do that. Right. You okay. might not have a choice. Exactly. Because we don't have a lot of good natural light inside usually. <laughs> no, and, and window light is best. If you're shooting flowers indoors, a a absolutely you want window light. But... For the most part, you're going to have to cover that window with something, white paper or something of that nature, again, so that you're getting diffused light. Right. So we want to shoot flowers always, no matter the type of light source, broad light, okay. not pinpointed light. Okay, good. That's good stuff you got going on here. So, so you never do photo, flowers? You never photograph like in a studio or inside your house or anything like that? I have north-facing windows on my lanai. Oh, okay. Well, so that's... I have done it inside, but it ha it's the rare occasion because if someone gives me a nice bouquet of flowers, I will take one or two and I will take it into that little lanai area and do some photography. And lanai it. is a porch. Yes, lanai is a porch. See, that's another lingo thing. That's yes. a Florida lingo. That's I, a Florida I get it, lingo. But hopefully, we have lots and lots of people watching from all over the world. Yes. <laughs> So, the opportunity to do that for me, though, is rare. I don't often go out and get live flowers and bring them inside to shoot unless I'm doing a project, I have a reason 
that sort of thing. About two years ago, I did a whole um, light table type of photography thing that I wanted to try out. So I was using, um, you know, light in that fashion on my lanai porch to photograph flowers, and I, and I didn't love it, so I stopped ah. doing it. <coughs> because you have a very distinct style. I do. And you, I mean, it's, your flowers are all different, but you can kind of see that this is a Rosie Lalonde look or something. Yes. And it is a very soft and, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the right word. Like I, I'm one of... A romantic a, almost. A, that's exactly what I was going to say. Romance, I really do come with a heart of love when I approach flower photography. And I get so into it that I, sometimes I look at the back of my camera and I, my heart just fills. Uh. And I haven't even gotten it in my computer yet. Wow. So I'm hoping that if I see that, somebody else is going to yeah. see that. All right, so let's not get to the processing just <coughs> yet. So what else about shooting? At, you know, now, so do you go out to, like, the botanical gardens and yes. your garden at home? and Yes. Now, because I teach, I have planned trips to botanical gardens and... Um, fields of flowers in different places. In September, I'm going to um, shoot dahlias at a dahlia farm in Oregon. Wow, that sounds fun. So, you know, you have to plan those types so of trips. Are you going to Holland for tulips? Or you can go to Michigan for tulips. <laughs> My dream is Kuchenhof. Oh. So one of these Aprils. Is that the time to go, April? Yes. Like I, they tell me mid-April. One of these mid-Aprils, Rosie will be at Kuchenhof. What about the Florida sunflowers? Do you know what I'm talking about? I do know, I do know Florida sunflowers. Because we only get those two weeks a year, right? Yes. And, and you get them, <coughs> I guess you get them later than we do, right? A little or bit sooner. later. Later. A little bit later than you do down Because we get them the first week in October about. And we're definitely later than that. Okay. Now, if it's a bright sunny day again, you've got to, you can't really shoot sunflowers that are not in the sun okay but you can wait for the time of day when we get a little cloud cover okay so later in the day later in the day maybe so that you can see maybe blue sky behind the flower but it's you know the sun's not drenching the flower and um you know not not now, what making do you do to photograph a florida sunflower because what are they seven feet tall they but are they're tiny little flowers right right bring a ladder so you bring a big ladder. Absolutely. And do you photograph just one, or do you try to get the fields? Because most of what I've seen, with you've just got like one flower at a time, right? I have, from time to time, shot fields of flowers. Again, it's really got to be talking to me, saying, fields hey. Fields are hard to, I think fields of flowers are, are really hard right. to come up, because you need some kind of thing to anchor the picture. You do. So you need something, some you point do. of interest. and. If it's just a field of flowers, what's your point of interest sometimes? Well, that's it. You know? last, last March, Mike and I went to Dallas um, to do the blue bonnet. Mm. And so there were these beautiful fields of blue bonnets. And frankly, very uninteresting. It, it looked like a snapshot, no matter what I did. So on the third day, I said to Mike, look, we're waiting for sunset. And we're going to go out there at sunset, and we're going to do this at sunset. Well, sunset was just before a thunderstorm was coming in. Ooh. So we had this really fabulous sky. And I did have to take several shots and combine them in Photoshop so that I could get proper exposure for the sky in the field. Okay. But boy, did that work. And it was just so much fun. Yeah. So fields of flowers are not generally my thing. Again, I'm more into relationship. So I find that one that's calling my name. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a little sidestep here for a quick two minutes. Okay. In the height of my wedding photography days, I paid $2,000 to see, to spend a week with the wedding photographer in the world. He was titled the world's best wedding photographer. Who's that? Jerry Guiones. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
I went to Boston, <clears throat> paid for Boston Hotel on top of my 2000 paid for Boston food and travel, uh -huh. and spent a week with Jerry and melted over his work knowing that, Jerry, you got it, I don't, I'm going home. <laughs> But he said one thing that made every penny that I spent worthwhile. And every day that I pick up a camera, I think of this always. He said, do not click that shutter until you hear the angels sing. <laughs> so my one-on-one -on -one with flowers, if I'm not hearing those angels, I'm moving on from you. But truthfully, that's it for me. I feel something inside. I get this gushy romantic feeling. And I know I'm going to spend time with you until I capture your essence. Now, what about the Lens Baby? Tell me about that. Lens Baby is, I have this love-hate thing with Lens Baby. Me too. I just do. Me too. <laughs> They're hard to use. They're very hard to use. And frankly... But sometimes you get such cool stuff out of them. You do. And so that's why my smallest camera carries my lens baby all the time. Now, I've gone from the system, lens baby system, to a Velvet 56. Okay. And, and I, that's one particular type of lens? It's one particular type okay. of lens. Uh -huh. And it goes from 1.4 to f22. Oh, wow. Shooting at 1.4, it's this glow. It just, the flower has this glow. Or um, the coffee cup has the glow. It doesn't matter what you're shooting. It has this wonderful glow. Um, <clears throat> now, that's kitschy, and you certainly wouldn't want every image to look like that. Uh -huh. But it, it does have its place. And so I've dedicated it on this camera body. And it's not a full-frame camera body. It's what does it do at f22? At f22, it's probably like taking a macro lens and shooting f11. Does it? So it doesn't blur aside like it, like all the. That's what I think of lens babies is being able to move the depth of field around or no. Not really, but it also doesn't give you the same type of image that you get out of a, a traditional image, whether it be telephoto or macro or just you know, 50 millimeter. It has this look to it. And mm -hmm. I, that's uh, the only way I can explain it, this look. A look. And again, sometimes I love that look and sometimes I'm like, okay, no. Ah. And nothing against Lens Baby. And I have a dear friend that works with me sometimes at my workshops. And she is a lens baby photographer. It doesn't matter what the subject is. She can make anything look good. And she uses the system a lot. Okay. She also has a Velvet 56, but she does use the lens baby system. And bless her heart. But I'm not her. And I know that when we talk floral photography, there are going to be a million people out there that can identify with some of what I'm saying, but they have their own niche and their right. own calling. And that's wonderful because we need all of us to make the world go around. <laughs> okay, so let's move into post-processing. Okay. What are some of your favorite trip, tips, tricks, tools? Okay. So I'm gonna what, is your, what is your workflow? My workflow is all Photoshop, but I want to start with Lightroom. Okay, so you, do you import your pictures into Lightroom? I do not. I am not a Lightroom user, but most people that I teach are Lightroom users. So I want to talk about the develop module a little bit for Lightroom users. Yeah, I, I had to force myself to learn Lightroom because I was happy with the Canon software. Yes. Do you, are you a Canon shooter? I'm a Nikon shooter, Nikon. but th I But their Canon software is really good. It's free. It comes with your camera, and I started using it right when I got my exactly. first digital camera. And I did not want to move to Lightroom because Lightroom's more complicated to learn, and mm -hmm. the Canon software was fine, but... When you're teaching, you have to kind of have a general knowledge of you do. pretty much everything. <laughs> you, you absolutely do. And here's uh. the thing. It's all a, an Adobe engine, and it works the same um, if you're using a raw image. It kind of works the same even in Adobe uh, Photoshop Elements. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, let's start with Lightroom. Okay. That develop module is there for purpose, and I would encourage people, please don't bypass that. You need to develop your image. When I shot film, mm -hmm. I lived and died by who processed my film. Mm -hmm. Because somebody who had a hut in the parking lot of some shopping mall oh, was, yeah. wasn't going to develop my images with the same enthusiasm or um, love that this gentleman in this lab is going to do, whom I got to know and he knows a little bit about how I photograph and why I photograph, he did a better job. Right. He was four or five times the price than the little hut, but I could sell his images. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm responsible for being the person on the end of that, you have to develop the image. If you're shooting JPEG, it's going to come out with some contrast and maybe even some color that needs to be adjusted. If it's hot, it needs to be adjusted and you need to watch for that. So it's very important that you use that develop module. If you don't use any other sliders, please use these. You want to make sure that you do not, do not, do not use your exposure first. Okay. You are going to go to your highlights and you're going to bring your highlights down. You're going to bring your shadows up. Okay. You're going to bring your whites up. And if you still feel like you need exposure, then ah. you use exposure. So highlights, shadow, whites. Exposure. If you what need What about it. blacks? Don't they get in there? No. If, <laughs> if you really need it, fine. But you're bringing your shadows up so that the darker places in the flower or in the leaves now has more exposure that you're not going to get by just using the exposure slider. Okay. You use that exposure slider, you're saying, I'm working globally in this image. So the way you work with any image in post-processing is you work locally and then globally. And what do you mean by that? Locally means that highlights are only going to affect highlights in the image locally. Mm, okay. Shadows are going to affect just shadows in an image, mid-tones, locally. Whites are going to work on your highlights locally. But don't you feel, and now I know you don't like real contrasty pictures, but isn't using your highlights and your shadows and your whites, aren't you going to be losing a lot of contrast? You don't. No? Because of the order that I'm saying to use them in. Oh. You are actually, those whites add the perfect contrast okay. in. Okay. And again, so if you felt like you wanted a little more contrast, there is a contrast slider there. Use yeah. it. Yeah. You know, I'm saying basics. Okay. And okay. because I know I'm going to process beyond basics, I don't want to introduce anything that I know I'm going to get a little bit later using something else. And if you're not using... Lightroom, if you're shooting in RAW, you can use Adobe Camera Raw to do the exact same thing. You actually can develop a JPEG in Adobe Camera Raw. You just right-click on it and say open in Adobe Camera Raw. I believe it's in the filter, right? Is that what it is? Um, you, you are going to, uh, actually, if you have uh, uh, Photoshop, you're best off starting with Bridge. Okay. So look at the image in Bridge, right-click on it and an option will be open in Adobe Camera Oh, Raw. okay, okay. So that's a great way to approach processing. But it's better to shoot in RAW, right? It is much better to but shoot if, in but RAW. But you can still process the JPEGs the same way. You can process the JPEGs okay. the same way. Okay. When I go into Adobe Camera Raw, I use those sliders. Same ones. Same ones that we just talked Highlights, about. Highlights, shadows, whites. In, in that, that order. order. <laughs> <laughs> Contrast and exposure oh. if you feel like you need it. But again, anything beyond that is going to deal with the image globally. And so much a part of processing any image is you want to affect just the areas that are going to sing the loudest. Okay. That are going to say, look at me, look at me, look at me, and are worth looking at. Okay. Okay? So now that I've used Adobe Camera Raw to take those steps, I'm in Photoshop, and now I can begin to do any processing that I want. Okay. The first thing that I do is look for obvious defects in the flower, the leaves, or the background. Again, in that order. Process the, the flower first, the leaves, and then look at your background. 
because if your background isn't perfect, you might be able to take the, one of the tools in Photoshop and just go ahead and take out a distraction or two or three in the background. If the background needs more work than that, I would say let's think about replacing the background. Okay. If you replace the background, you are going to save a copy of what you've done, uh -huh. flatten that copy, okay. and now begin to do your enhancements. Okay. The first place I go for enhancements is Nick filters. Everybody loves Nick. They do. <laughs> it's still the best. And I know it's very... Somebody said they sold it, too. Google sold it. Google sold it to someone else who's revitalizing it. Okay. I hope they don't change it too much because, really, it was wonderful. Yeah. I've tried a lot of different things since Google bought it because mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to get it to work with new versions of Photoshop. Somebody did tell me this little trick. If you go to File and Automate, there's an option that opens the Nick Filters interface. Okay. And then if you work through that interface, it does work in Photoshop all the time. Oh. And so far, I haven't had a problem. When I was going I to about that. Filters uh, Nick in Photoshop, it yeah. was crashing. Okay, so you go to File, Automate, and then there's an option to open the Nick Filters. Um, it, it, it's basically um, an interface that opens up that allows you to see all of your Nick filters and choose what you want. Um, oh. So I use Color Effects Pro, and I, then I open Color Effects Pro from there, and I'm able to do the things that I okay. like to do. I'm going to try that. Okay. All right. So if you're into Nick filters and you think maybe one of those filters. No, right now, Nick filters are free. They are. So you can just go on <coughs> Google. How do they get it? Actually, it's Nick, N I K, N I K, and I want to say NickFilters.com, but that could be wrong. I just do a search in Google, <laughs> and you can do that. Um, it's not a Google download, if you will. It actually goes to the Nick website, okay, um, and allows you to. There's a download there for Mac and PC. Okay, and it's free. It is free. It might not be free now that somebody bought it, though. Um, I think when they reintroduce it with all the bells and the whistles that they're going to add to it, it will not be free That's anymore. So get it now. Get it while you can. <laughs> okay, so we we went to File, Automate, Nick, Filters, or whatever. Color so Effects Pro. Color Effects Pro is what you like. Yes, and um, I sometimes if I want a little more contrast in my image, I go to the contrast filters that are built right into Nick. And obviously, Nick will apply it to the entire image unless you say don't. Okay, so what do you do? You select something? What I do is I use, there's an option on the bottom that says brush. Okay. And so what happens is it goes back into Photoshop. You've got a black mask. Uh -huh. And now you can, with a white paintbrush, paint in exactly what you want and only what you want from that Nick filter. Look at the interface, click apply, and now you've got an image with no more mask on it with just the amount um, applied that you wanted. Hold on. i got to think this through because it's been a while since I've used my neck filters, but I don't remember a mask. You put the mask in in Photoshop. Only if you click brush. If you click OK, it globally applies your filter. You click brush in the neck filters. Yes. Oh, I guess I don't know them that well. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> and that is specifically, hey, I only want this, the, you know, that I've, uh, this filter that I've applied to just this part of the image. That's when brush works very well. Now, what part do you have favorite, like, I don't know, what do they call them, filters within the color effects that you like? Uh, I like Glamour Glow. I like Glamour Glow. I like Tonal Contrast. Okay. And I like Color Only Contrast. Color Only Contrast. Okay, I don't know that one. So those are the three that I use the most. All right. But occasionally I do go in there and I play. And so when you have time to play with your images, that's a great thing to do. I, you know, I don't do, I was on a kick for a while doing underwater photography in my pool of people. Yes. 
And the Nick filters for that kind of stuff was amazing. They have something called Pro Contrast yes. or something, and that it like cleared up the colors in the pool, and yes. it was amazing. Because I never, I never had a professional camera underwater. I just used my point and shoot. Yes. Well, I shouldn't say never, because after I got into it, I got a bag. Sure. But then I, then I just that wore off. <laughs> I haven't done it in a while, <laughs> but it was fun for a while, and then I got bored. I get bored easily. Move on, right? That's it. Okay, so what else? I love Topaz Impression. Oh, and that what that does is turns it into a painting, a right? A painting. Or looks like a painting. However, um, I never leave that on 100% opacity. Okay. I want to give a little caveat here. If you're going to use any topaz filter, and I don't care which one it is, make sure you duplicate your layer. First, before first. you work on it. Yes, because you want to be able to reduce the opacity of the um, impression the or w whatever effect you're using, and that's the only way to do it. Uh -huh. Plus, you don't really ever want to work destructively. And if you allow any effect of any kind to be put right on, you know, your background image, um, if you later change your mind, it's too late. You're doomed. You are doomed. <laughs> Especially if you haven't saved your previous, uh, you know, version that you started with. <clears throat> and I can't impress enough on your audience how important it is to back up in your PSD files. A lot of people just want to flatten everything and keep it. Even if you reduce the size of the file because you don't want these huge, large files, it's so important, though, to, to keep that PSD file. If that image is important to you, you want to sell it, you think you know, you're know you happy with it today, and three weeks from now you learn this new thing and think, gee, if I could go back in there and try this on Good it. point. Okay. Yeah, I know um, Joe Fitzpatrick went to a talk by Rick Salmon, and yes. he said, he said, boy, I would have thrown away some of the pictures he took, and then he processed them, and they looked yes. amazing. He said, now I'm going to go back and look at my old pictures Absolutely. and see what I can pull out. Absolutely. And it's funny that he says that, because there are pictures that he's taken that he's processed that I thought the same thing. I would have thrown that picture away, and he made it into this beautiful picture. Yes. With the processing. Yes. So it's interesting. So again, Topaz, sometimes when that gets back into Photoshop, that effect is something that I only want here and there. Okay. So I will put a reverse or black mask on that layer. Again, with a white brush, I will just bring it back, bring back where I want it and how much I want. Okay. If I want it over the entire image, I just lower the opacity. And so that it's not in your face, this is my impressionistic image kind right. of thing. And by the way, I am going to just stop you and do a quick commercial Please because do. <laughs> if our audience isn't quite isn't following what we're talking about with the layers and the opacity and the layer masks, all of that is in our our Photoshop cram course online. We teach right from the beginning. We teach layers because you need layers. I you mean, do. the whole point of Photoshop Why is bother? layers, right? right? So we teach it in the beginner class, and our our online uh, software classes are all like three to five minute videos, just a little bit at a time yes. with a little bit of homework mm -hmm. so you can kind of follow along, do the work, move on like that. Okay, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love your commercial. <laughs> I'm going to say amen to it. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to learn. I, I mean, I was so, so surprised mm -hmm. when I first started teaching in 2009, everybody was buying Photoshop Elements. So I yes. bought Elements and I didn't like it because you couldn't do layers. Right. But then I think 10 you could. Yes. And then it was like, buy elements. Because a lot of hobbyists, they don't need, at the time, they didn't need to spend $700 on Photoshop. Correct. So. And we were talking earlier about shooting raw and processing raw. Photoshop Elements now has that same develop module that's in Lightroom and in Adobe Camera Raw. So you can process your yeah. images. Elements is great. Yes. I think for the hobbyist, they don't Absolutely. need to have a $10 a month. No fee for Photoshop and Lightroom. Do not. They can, Elements is Do great. Not. So. The only thing that I would caution though is if you're going to spend 80 something dollars for Elements, I think it is, yeah. You know you're going to need to upgrade that mm, probably at least every 18 to 24 months.
yeah. because they keep putting more and more into it. At that point, it doesn't pay to spend another 80. You, you might want to consider the su Just subscription Photoshop at that point. Yeah. Yeah, Photoshop's harder to learn, though, you know? Um, Photoshop Elements is kind of, I'm very impressed with what they've done with it. They've made it a lot easier to use. Yes. Now, you teach workshops. I do. And you are a good teacher. I feel like this was a really good show. We had, you, you had a lot of great tips. So how can we find out more about what you got? What do you have going on? What's up next for you? What's up next for me is uh, tulips in two weeks at uh, Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. Tulips in two weeks. Tulips <laughs> in two weeks. <laughs> What's the date? Um, it is the 19th, 20th, and 21st of April, and we still have room if you want to join us. Um, and that is a photography only. There are literally 50 acres of tulips. And you this, could. I have got a, everybody who comes on the show talks about Longwood Gardens. Yes. <laughs> and they also have the conservatory. So if you get tired of the tulips outside, you can go in the conservatory. And there are other things in the conservatory oh, wow. that you you know can certainly shoot. Um, I was there for blue poppies uh, just a few Ooh. weeks ago in March. So next for me, obviously, is the tulip photography. Mm -hmm. um, I am pinpointing some days in August to have a Photoshop deep dive in Orlando. Ooh, a deep dive. Deep dive. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> we, we did that last year. You've got to know a little bit about Photoshop, or you should. Mm -hmm. I won't say you have to, but you should. And we go three days. The first day is more for the beginner to intermediate, and days two and three are for m intermediate on out. Okay. People that want to know more. Combining several images in Photoshop and um, doing um, composites and learning the deepest, darkest secrets there are to know in Photoshop. And it's three days. It's three days. Wow. And when is that? I'm looking for dates to set up in oh. August. Um, I, I need to pin down a place. Um, the facility that I used last year was nice, but um, left some things to be desired. So I want a place that people can stay and we can hang out at night and have some fun and learn Photoshop and, learn. I and, love and, it. and have wine and Photoshop at night if, if we want to. That's what we do on my ladies weekends. Yes. The wine and Photoshop goes good together. <laughs> In September, I am doing the dahlias at the Swan Island Dahlia Farm. And, and where is that? That's in Oregon? It's in Oregon. It's just outside Portland. If people want to know more about any of the workshops coming up or education in general, my website is www.imagesthatspeak.org. Oh, imagesthatspeak.org. Yes. And the education tab or the workshops tab will have any information. And uh, contact me information is there as well. Because one of the things that I do love to do and I would love to do more of is one-on-one -on -one Photoshop training via GoToMeeting. Yeah. So we set up a GoToMeeting. You meet with me online. You have already sent me a couple of images and said, what would I do with these? Please help. We go through that. It's recorded. You get the recording. That's great. I love that. And for me personally, more painting in Photoshop. Okay. And painter. And we want to have something new to teach. And if I don't keep learning, I will wither. So I, I won't know. do that. I get bored so easily. And it's not that I get by. I just think everything in our lives is pushing the envelope. Technology, computers, mm -hmm. everything. And so if we don't live on that edge, we will wither. Yeah, I agree. you got to keep up. Got to keep up. Got to keep up. Keep that brain sharp. Absolutely. <laughs> So imagesthatspeak.org. Yes. All right. And we will have that link and some of Rosie's flowers on, um, on our website in the show notes, understandphotography.com. You'll see a little tab that says the Understand Photography Show, so you can see the show notes there. And her, we'll have the video embedded there as well. So, um, And they can link over to your site, find out what you got going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. We'd love to, love to have them. And next week on the Understand Photography Show, my, my guest is Jo Krebin, who is a travel photographer. And she's going to talk about selling stock photography. Everybody's like, oh, stock photography, there's no money in it anymore. 
Well, maybe. Watch next week's show and you'll find out more. So tune in here if you want to watch us live. Tune, us, tune in on the Understand Photography Facebook page at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Or again, you can watch the recording on YouTube or listen on iTunes to the Understand Photography Show. I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks for watching episode number 82. We will see you next week. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.